I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We meet in the name of Jesus Christ, who died and was raised to the glory of God the Father. Grace and mercy be with you. Welcome, everyone, to this service. We come, of course, mindful of the death of the Queen this week. Come, I hope, with thanksgiving in our heart, but obviously with sadness as well. We come, perhaps, to pray for those who mourn, particularly our royal family at this time, and to pray for our new king, King Charles III. But there is something special, isn't there, about coming together at these times to support and encourage one another. And as we come to a service of worship, to remind ourselves that we come in the presence of God to seek his help and to be assured that our lives are in his hands. And as we know, the faith of the Queen was so important to her, and we share in that faith as we come together. So I trust this service will be of help to you. Uh, I'm very grateful to those who have worked hard to make sure we have a book of condolence ready for people to sign. Many people signed yesterday. It's here in church today. It's just here at the moment to my right. You're very welcome to add your comments um, at the end of the service. Uh, It will be available in church today until five o'clock when we will close the building. Uh, For the rest of the week, it will be available in our porch out there. As you know, we are doing work on the building at the moment, which means the building does need to be closed during the week, but the book of condolence itself will be available in the porch between 9 and 5 during the week. The epistle is taken from 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 1 to 7 and 12 to 17. I, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Saviour and of Jesus Christ our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. 
Glory to you, O Lord. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Lord, take my words and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lives and set them on fire with love for you, now and always. Amen. Do please be seated. As Alan said, uh, today I had prepared uh, and was prepared to lead you in the beginning of a ser series of sermons on the pastoral epistles, uh, the epistles of Paul, uh, at least attributed to Paul, uh, to Timothy uh, and to the church, the newly found church in Ephesus. Uh, and instead, of course, many of you have come today to pay your respects to the late Queen Elizabeth the second. And so we decided that we should try and, as it were, concentrate on that, but at the same time reflect on the words which we have heard of the epistle. And of course, the short straw fell to me. So, your sympathy would be much appreciated. <laughs> I want to begin by taking you back, strangely perhaps, to the coronation. The coronation of the late Queen, uh, and of course the coronation that we shall be anticipating ere long uh, for King Charles III. And I do so deliberately because at that event, at that service, amongst 142 unbelievably objects that are used in the coronation, there are three in particular that I would like to draw our attention to. And I will explain why in a moment. The first object that is given to the Queen is what is called the orb, which you may recall looks like a globe, it's in gold, it is encrusted with pearls, divided into three, reflecting the fact that medieval rulers thought that's how the world was divided, uh, and above it is a cross. And it symbolises the fact the incredibly important fact that although the monarch has been given the power he or she is given, nevertheless, God gives that authority to the monarch. And the cross reflects the fact that Christ the Redeemer is the means by which she or he learns how that authority should be exercised. The example being that of the selfless servant in the form of Christ himself. The second of the symbols is the orb, which is the long sort of wave, wand that has the largest diamond in the world encrusted in it. And it is a sign of the authority that is given to the monarch at the time of the coronation and it is significantly handed to the monarch with the words, exercise this authority with mercy and equity. The command to somehow or another take the extraordinary authority given to the monarch and to exercise it with a sense of due conscience, a sense of awareness 
of the needs of the variety of citizens that are entrusted to the monarch. And the last is the sword, the end of which has been removed, of Edward the Confessor, which is a symbol of the power which is given to the monarch, but which is, as it were, cut short deliberately to remind the monarch that they should do all that they do with a sense of compassion and love, not necessarily using the powers of judgment that they could, but always exercising that sense of compassion, of understanding of those to whom they are given the authority. So the enormous significance of faith, of humility, of compassion, and of love are there from the beginning, and no one, no one, I would suggest, will ever exemplify them to the degree that the late Queen Elizabeth has done. Go back over 19 centuries to our epistle, and extraordinarily, you will hear Paul extolling those early Christians to exercise almost exactly the same qualities in their lives. Show, he says, genuine love, sincere compassion, and true faith. And he does so to a church or a group of Christians far away from the beginnings, as it were, of the Christian faith, and so struggling, in a sense, to assimilate what they know with the society in which they lived, which was a very secular society, full of very pompous folk who loved to strut around in the marketplace of a day, involved in intellectual gymnastics to show just how bright and intelligent they were. And Paul says, no, that is not what the faith is all about. It is all about a level of simplicity, of holding on to a sense of purpose and direction, and not allow yourselves to end up competing to show how superior you are. That will destroy the Christian faith. You must show a level of trust. There's that word again. The sort of trust that God showed in me, says Paul. One of the worst persecutors of the early church and yet trusted in the end by God to be, in his own words it has to be said, one of the greatest apostles. Not sure about Paul's humility at this moment in time. And he reminds the Christian church that if God can do this, if he can entrust this task to someone who has failed as abysmal as he, as Paul had as Saul earlier in his life, then he can take any one Christian, any one of us, and achieve things way beyond what we may consider our ability, or indeed, our original sense of purpose for ourselves. Now, you will begin to see that there is an extraordinary sense of continuity between the church as it was being formed in that first century, those principles of love, of compassion, of understanding, and of faith, lived out through the centuries and then finally exemplified to the full by her late, the late Queen Elizabeth II. It is extraordinary to see how those qualities have survived and will survive. But in reflecting on her life, with everything we know about her and that life, the last thing on earth she would want of us today would be simply to listen to what wonderful things she has done 
and go away as if it had no implications for our lives. Her life never, ever pointed to herself. In everything she said and in everybody she met, she constantly pointed them beyond herself. She showed a level of humility which was quite extraordinary to achieve and she would want us to be doing the same not to focus on her alone, but to use that focus to direct or redirect our lives, to show the same measure of humility and of selflessness as she demonstrated in the way she lived. It's interesting, I used the word selflessness the other day and was corrected by a young person to say, did you mean selfishness? <laughs> there is something hugely significant about that comment. But she also showed remarkable courtesy and compassion for everyone. You all have heard the stories that we have been seeing on the news, on the radio, on the television and you can see that she treated the royal footman with exactly the same concern and courtesy as she did a member of the Privy Council. She understood people because she was guided and directed in all that she did by the example of Christ the Redeemer, the cross above the orb that she received at her coronation. And when you listen to some of the discussions that are now recorded between herself and other leaders of the world, all of them pay tribute to the fact that they appreciated her sense of justice, which rang out in the way that she conducted her life, and which many took home to try and develop in the countries from which they came a wonderful sense of justice, of courtesy, and understanding. But all of these qualities were bound together like the sort of letters through a stick of rock in her life by her faith. The faith on which she clearly lent throughout her life. The faith that shines through in all that she did, a faith that whatever happened, God remained in control and she was simply acting as a servant to him. As we begin to face the next stage, the reign of King Charles III, we need to commit ourselves to those same qualities as she demonstrated in her life. There are incredibly difficult times ahead. There is no doubt about that. But if we could show due humility, if we could show a level of selflessness in the way in which we use the resources entrusted to us, if we could keep an eye out and show love and courtesy for others who may be struggling but find it difficult to ask for help. And above all else, if we can attribute what we do not to ourselves, not to show what clever individuals we are, but holding on to that simple faith which guided and directed our late Queen throughout her long and extraordinary life. I finish with some words from our Gospel. Trust in God, said Jesus, trust also in me. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That guided and directed our late Queen Elizabeth II, it will no doubt guide 
King Charles III. May she rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. Following the Queen's death, let us begin with a prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray for Queen Elizabeth and her exceptional reign, her deep affection for her people, her lifelong desire to serve the common good, her humility and grace, hard work and dedication we thank you, living Lord. Be with the King and members of the royal family as they mourn the loss of a mother and grandmother, as well as a friend and monarch. In the royal palaces, crown them with your loving kindness. Be with our national leaders, our prime minister, and our government at this time of uncertainty and change. In the corridors of power, crown them with your heavenly wisdom. Be with her people in nation and commonwealth as they mourn a monarch and peacemaker and rejoice in the cultural diversity celebrated under her reign in the four corners of her realm, crown us with peace and goodwill. Be with people throughout the world who are struggling to make peace, longing for healing, grieving the loss of someone they love. In pain and grief, crown the nations of the earth with the light of your love. In silence, we remember with thanksgiving the life of Elizabeth, your servant and our queen, that she may rest from her labors and rejoice in the one whom she worshiped as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Dear Father, we thank you that in this unsettling time, you are faithful and unchanging. Thank you for giving us strength in the present and a hope for the future. We pray for our new church development plan. Help us to engage with it and to be united in our vision. Today we pray especially that we might grow in confident witness and service. We thank you for our ministry team and pray that you will bless and encourage them in serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Dear living Lord, we thank you for our community, its vibrancy, and compassion. We pray for the work of the meeting place and our links, Margaret Hibbert and Val Lambert. We pray for our social and events team and their work over many years. We remember our neighbors in Highcroft Road. Help us to be aware of those in our community who are struggling with rising costs. Bless those who work for the community fridge and for CAP. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Dear loving Father, we bring to you those grieving the loss of Heather Day, nay Rolls, and for those we know who are ill, especially Eldred Clark, Tim Carlier, Catherine Jobson, Valerie Good, and Elizabeth Finucan. Father, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. 